Aloha, and welcome back to another episode of Talk Story with House Majority. My name is Della Alvalotti, and I serve as the House Majority Leader for the Hawaii State Legislature. We have a little different show for you this week, so I'll keep this intro brief with just a few reminders about where you can find the Hawaii House Majority. Please follow the House Majority on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at High House Dems for the most current news, events, and updates. You can also visit our website at hawaiihousedemocrats.com, which has resources, news stories, and valuable information about our House committees, legislators, and the 2021 legislative session. So that's done. Let's jump right into this week's topic, cannabis. Every session, cannabis is a hot, hot topic. Been this way every session since I've served in the House. Hawaii's legislative approach has, was groundbreaking when medical cannabis was first recognized in 2000, before I was elected. Fast forward to 2014, I was part of a legislative task force and really community groups and stakeholders who worked for over a year, delved deep into the issue of medical cannabis dispensaries and tackled the question of how do we develop a safe, legal, regulated system through which patients could get their medicine. I wanna kick off this episode by showing you all a short video from the Hawaii Cannabis Industry Association that paints a really good picture of the current state of medical cannabis in the state today. Six years after the passage of House Bill 321, creating Hawaii Medi Hawaii's medical cannabis dispensary system, we have this uh, status update from HICIA. You know, without the dispensaries, probably a lot, a lot of people wouldn't have it available in any form. You have to be in the right crowd, have to know the right people to get the underground stuff in. If you're over 30 or 40, it's hard to find that, that group. It's, uh, it's tested, it's clean, it's consistent. The quality is always uh, great quality. They really are helpful. My name is Randy Gantz. I am the new director of the Hawaii Cannabis Industry Association. The mission of our organization is that we protect and promote the legal cannabis industry by providing members a unified voice, effective advocacy, education, and strong leadership. Of the eight Hawaii state licensed dispensary entities, there are 15 of the total allowable 24 retail locations open currently. One on Kauai, six on Oahu, two on Maui, and six on the Big Island. These dispensaries serve our nearly 30,000 patients with clean, regulated, and tested medicinal cannabis products. Since 2017, the following forms of products have been systematically introduced by our dispensaries. Flour, concentrates, safe pulmonary administration devices, topicals, and most recently edibles to patients suffering from the following conditions. Dispensaries currently service only 35% of the patient population, while the remaining 65% are being served by caregivers or the illicit market. A spike in cannabis caregivers stacking patient recommendations and plant counts contradicts the original intent to regulate the highest quality tested products for our local patients. An increase in dispensary retail locations for easier patient access and the eventual introduction of a dual system, medicinal and adult use, could reflect nationwide trends as we move closer to the legal acceptance of cannabis. As outdoor cannabis cultivation is prohibited in Hawaii, Dispensary cultivation facilities are either indoor or greenhouse, requiring complex technology and upfront expense. 70% of expenditures were purchased locally. Delays in capital-intensive startup costs totaling nearly $40 million contributed to the dearth of profitability at this time. Contrary to the common misperception, our local dispensaries as a whole are not profitable businesses. As of 2019, dispensary licensees have spent nearly $76 million, while revenues are estimated to be $33 million, yielding a net loss of roughly $42 million. Low patient count, the inability to write off business expenses as detailed in Section 280E and ongoing high operating costs have led to these negative results. Continuing to abide by the provisions of our current system would prove Hawaii's medical cannabis program unsustainable. This path will force patients to turn to the illicit market where medicine is unregulated and revenues fuel illegal untaxed transactions. Making impactful contribution to Hawaii's state economic growth, our medical cannabis industry has generated an additional output of 141.9 million, 635 jobs due to its creation, and a total of 18.4 million in federal, state, and local tax revenues. Dispensaries have made extensive efforts to adhere to the rules set forth by the legislature and the DOH. With no reports of theft or diversion by the dispensaries, Hawaii continues to deliver regulated, clean, safe, tested products to patients. As negative stigma decreases, research continues to advance, and our industry continues to follow global and national trends of acceptance, many are proud to support an industry assisting local patients through our state-regulated medical cannabis program. 
If we want a professional industry, this is the pathway to getting a strong system. It's not just about the growing aspect, it's about building an industry. Our organization is really dedicated to the industry's growth in Hawaii. With the talk about adult use and legalization and its being on the horizon, we really want to make sure that at least the current industry we have is, is really geared towards Hawaii's people and Hawaii's economy. We haven't seen an, an increase in crime, there's been no theft, there's been no um, issues at our dispensaries. They're professional, they're clean places. They really exemplify, I, I believe, the values of Hawaii. They have been great additions to our economy, great additions to our communities. We've really proven a lot of uh, the naysayers wrong. We have the ability to grow this industry from these islands and make it for these islands. We know that government is not inexpensive and we need to continue to generate revenues. This is one way to do it safely and do it in a way where we already have a system for our dispensaries that can sell and that's already set up. Thank you HICIA for that great video update. With me now, I have Michelle Nakata, Supervisor of the Medical Cannabis Dispensary Licensing, licensing Section from the Office of Medical Cannabis Control and Regulation. Thank you so much, Ms. Michelle, for joining me on this episode. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. Thank you. So for those watching uh, who may know a little bit about med medical cannabis a lot or may not know anything at all, what exactly is the Hawaii Office of Medical Cannabis Control and Regulation? And what's your role? What do you do there? Okay. Um, so the Office of Medical Cannabis Control and Regulation, or OMCCR, uh, which you were instrumental in establishing, uh, joined together two previously existing separate programs, uh, the Patient Registry section, uh, Program and the Dispensary Licensing Program. Uh, OMCCR is responsible for implementing the medical use system, uh, primarily to ensure that qualifying registered patients have safe access to cannabis for medical use. The program, as I mentioned, is comprised of the patient registry section, which oversees the registration of patients with qualifying medical conditions. And the dispensary licensing system is responsible for regulatory oversight of um, Hawaii's eight dispensary licensees. I joined the program in December, 2018, uh, primarily to supervise the dispensary section, but also I was help, um, asked to help stand up the new combined office of medical cannabis control and regulation. So you come on in 2018 and then by 2020, we're in the middle of a pandemic and <laughs> you're dealing with that, right? Okay, we'll get back to that later on. But for those of you uh, not familiar, you got a little bit about the dispensary system, but can you tell us a little bit more about the dispensary system that might be uh, interesting to our listeners? Sure. So as I mentioned, Hawaii has a total of eight licensees uh, statewide. Two are on the Big Island, two are in Maui, one's on Kauai, and we have three on Oahu. Uh, so Hawaii has what's called a strict vertical system. And what that means is that each of Hawaii's licensees is responsible for everything uh, from cultivation to manufacturing products, packaging um, and all the way through retail dispensing. Um, they are allowed to subcontract various aspects of their operation, but each licensee is solely responsible for the entire operation. Um, each of the licensees is allowed to have a total of two production centers, and uh, that's for cultivation and manufacturing, um, and then they can have three retail locations each. Uh, currently, we have a total of 28 facilities statewide, um, and that includes 11 production centers and 17 retail locations. Each of the production centers is allowed to have up to 5,000 cannabis mm -hmm. plants. So that basically means that each licensee is allowed to cultivate a maximum of 10,000 plants. Um, in order to keep track of everything, the state maintains uh, an electronic seed to sale tracking system and um, that the licensees are required to also utilize. Uh, the system tracks each plant and material from each plant from growing through manufacturing, through laboratory testing, uh, to retail and also through destruction. Um, and 
This means that, you know, in addition to us being able to track plants and plant material forward through the system to make sure that there's no diversion, we can also backtrack um, any patient purchase to the actual source plant. And that's especially important in case, uh, you know, there's an adverse event or something, you know, is identified that necessitates doing a product recall. Um, also, um, unlike many states, Hawaii's rules require that every single batch of cannabis or manufactured cannabis product is required to be tested and meet all laboratory standards before it can be released for retail dispensing. So really, the Department of Health has continued to maintain a safe and regulated system is what I'm hearing from you. Yes. So some people would say that our system is a, is a little overly strict. Um, and I think that's actually been a good thing. You know, some of some some of the states that implement it early um, look back and say that it's it's a good idea to start really strict. And as you learn more about the system and about the industry, um, realize what it is that you can scale back on and, and loosen up that way instead of uh, doing what some other states have done, is, which is, you know, start very open and then um, are struggling to try to reel in different aspects of, of their um, cannabis systems. Sure. Okay. I want to get to your legislative priorities, but before we do that, since you mentioned it, have we ever had to recall any products in the a couple of years that the dispensaries have been operating? No, we have not. Um, I think probably the closest concern that um, since I've been on board was uh, when a couple of years ago when there was a nationwide outbreak of um, Ivali that was related to cartridges. Um, fortunately, Hawaii does, um, for some reason, when we when we established our rules, uh, we're very strict that the cartridges must contain only um, cannabis-derived oils. So we did not have an issue with the types of additives that were associated with the Ivali outbreak. And although Hawaii did have a few cases um, of suspected Ivali, uh, there were there were absolutely no illnesses that were associated with any dispensary products. I think that really speaks well both to the Department of Health and the C to track C to sale tracking your regulations, and it also speaks to our dispensaries adhering to the rules and regulations. So now that we're in the legislative session, we've got all, almost a month left to go. <laughs> what are the priorities of your office in 2021? Okay, so for this year. I would have to say that um, priority number one for our office has been to revise our administrative rules. Uh, so Hawaii Administrative Rules Chapter 11-850. Um, I'm pretty embarrassed. Uh, the rules have not been updated once since the dispensary system was established in 2015. Um, and we all know that a lot has changed. Um, so, so don't don't knock yourself too hard, Michelle, <laughs> because sometimes it takes departments five years to write rules. You guys did it fast. So I'm glad that that's your number one priority. But I'm sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. No, that's OK. Uh, that is definitely my number one priority. Um, other than that, I, you know, we would really like to establish a surveillance system for health impacts that are related to cannabis use use and then um, begin developing and disseminating health messaging based on what that data shows. Um, after all, you know, we are public health. Um, I've been a, a public health uh, practitioner for over 30 years now. Um, so in addition to ensuring safe access to patients, um, I feel that it's very important that we be monitoring for other impacts that the movement toward and acceptance acceptance of um, cannabis use is having, um, for example, you know, things such as youth use and um, even youth perception of cannabis, um, use during pregnancy and breastfeeding by women, impaired driving um, and impaired workplaces. Um, so, you know, with those priorities in mind, um, that brings me to this legislative session, um, what the program really needs is resources. Um, like everyone else, uh, COVID-19 has had a really significant impact on the Office of Medical Cannabis. 
Uh, we had six critical positions, and that includes the program manager, fiscal officer, epidemiologist, uh, information technology specialist, secretary even, and office assistant. They were all defunded as a result of the economic impacts. So yes, we've been uh, operating without any of those key positions. Um, but fortunately, and thankfully, uh, two measures, one of them a budget uh, budget bill and the other one uh, an appropriation bill, uh, they're both still alive and moving forward, and both of them reinstate funding for these six positions. So cross our fingers uh, that, you know, they, they will make one, at least one of them will make it to the end, and we will be able to finally recruit and fill those positions and fully operationalize the office. I think, um, you know, here in the House, we're very supportive of making sure that critical services get funded. And I think in this arena with the medical patients, uh, this this medical in industry, that we do need, in fact, the, those, those positions. So I'm hopeful. Uh, it's still tough because, yeah. you know, state revenues are just taking such a hit. But we're, we're working for that. So with laws and regulations are, that are new, complex, and constantly evolving um, as the <laughs> cannabis industry grows nationwide, what types of things that make your job difficult as a regulator here in Hawaii? I would say that I think that the most challenging thing um, has been that there really is, there's no roadmap to follow. Um, this is all new territory, especially for Hawaii. Um, and the fact that um, cannabis remains federally illegal it really exacerbates the situation. Um, and, you know, although there's been a lot of states that, that did implement before Hawaii, uh, every state was different. So the programs that they stood up, they're all very different. Um, so kind of rather than them being, you know, having necessarily paved a way for um, states like Hawaii and other states to just be able to follow, um, I, my view is more that they kind of laid down paving stones and, you know, what Hawaii and other states have to do is we have to pick those up and look at them and, you know, make a decision to choose what's right for us. And doing this really does, it take, takes a lot of time, of time and effort. Um, and this is kind of the reason why the establishment of the Cannabis Regulators Association or mm. CANRA. Um, has been such a great resource. Um, the ability to network with them and learn from um, other regulators has been extremely helpful. Uh, it's, so let me just jump right in here. What is CANRA? Because I don't think our viewers know that. Just in a nutshell, what is CANRA? So it was. It's an. It's a nonprofit organization that was just formed uh, this year, and it is an association of uh, states regulators. Uh, right now, it is strictly just uh, the primary regulatory agencies responsible for um, cannabis. And this includes both medical use as well as uh, recreational or adult use. And it also includes those states. A, a couple of the states are coming on board that are actually um, only uh, strictly CBD or low THC use. So uh, uh, more and more states are joining. Hawaii was a founding member of CANRA, um, and uh, we basically work together to, um, to try to establish uh, ideal, um, uh, an ideal regulatory framework, you know, build consensus around um, what kinds of things uh, should be at least the floor for all cannabis um, programs across the United States, you know, what should be testing standards, packaging and labeling standards and those sorts of things. And it's it'll be really important, especially as more and more states come on board, not just with medical use, but eventually with um, adult and recreational use, because it will allow for interstate commerce and, you know, and movement of products because there's a uniformity that's established. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited about the ability to participate um, in CANRA. Um, we, as I mentioned, are currently just state regulators. Uh, we mm -hmm. are going to be um, expanding shortly to allow for county and municipal regulators. Um, and then eventually with some affiliate um, organizations. Um, however, because we're still in our infancy, 
the the organization is not yet open to industry or um, advocacy groups. You know, I, I appreciate what you're talking about because I think it speaks to the complexity. Uh, everyone thinks that we can just jump right in um, with legalization, and that's just not the case when you think about the complexity across states, within states. Uh, we have a special, unique position where we are, um, you know, not even connected to the mainland uh, America. So, so questions about, you know, trade and commerce are all very big. You know, I have I have you for 40 more seconds. What do you envision for the future of cannabis in Hawaii? So right now, my focus is really on the medical use program. Um, in my opinion, it's still in its growing phase. Um, and, you know, it, to be it's, it's like cannabis plants. They need careful, the industry needs careful cultivation and care to reach its full potential. Um, so that being said, I really have no doubt that we will eventually see legalized adult use here. Um, and my my true hope is that we take good measure of what has and hasn't worked in the other states. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, because done right, I think legalization presents some excellent potential opportunities for the state. I'm so glad you are where you are, Michelle. <laughs> and I joked, we're not letting you retire. Um, thank you so much for sharing those insights with, with me. We've come such a long way, but there really is so much more work to be done. A couple of weeks ago, for my audience viewers, uh, we were able to visit uh, one of these dispensaries, uh, the newest retail location that's opened up with um, Tai Cheng of Aloha Green Ap Apothecary. Let's take a look at what uh, Tai has to say about this new retail area. Thank you, Ty, for having us here at Aloha Green Apothecary's third retail dispensing site. Uh, this has been a long journey for you and Aloha Green. So tell me about 2013 and 2015 first. Thank you, Representative. I'm glad that you're here today with your team. Uh, it's really exciting for Aloha Green uh, Apothecary this year. We're opening our third uh, location here on Oahu. It's our largest location. It's right by the uh, International Airport here. We're right next to the uh, rental rental car agencies. We think this is a, a great place because of the just where all the highways and uh, where people are able to come into the city and out of the city. It's one of those stops where when returning uh, residents come back to Hawaii, they can stop by our stores. And for even visitors who do uh, intend to come to Hawaii, uh, maybe one day they'll be able to take part in purchasing uh, cannabis as well. So this is your third dispensary retail site. So where are your other two? And where's your production center? Right, so when we first started uh, in 2016, we opened uh, the first uh, dispensary here in Honolulu. It was located, uh, it is located still at Interstate Building on South King Street, uh, at King Street in Kiyomoku. Uh, we have about 1,800 square feet there uh, with four POS. That's our original store. Uh, our second store was in Waikiki. We were the first dispensary to open in the Waikiki Business District. Uh, that location is located at Saratoga and Kalakaua, mm -hmm. right across uh, from the post office and next to eggs and things. Uh, it's been a great location for us, uh, especially with a lot of the locals returning to Waikiki since the pandemic mm -hmm. has uh, limited tourism in the area. And uh, our cultivation center is near the North Shore. It's uh, between Wahiwa and the North Shore and on old uh, dole pineapple land that, uh, that uh, we've leased to uh, grow cannabis. So tell me about this space. Um, what are some of the new innovations you've adopted? And then just tell us about some of your products here. Yeah, so the airport location, you know, we, we were uh, unlucky, I guess, to be building out during the pandemic period. And so we had to make sure that uh, patients uh, were safe, especially uh, medical card holder patients who uh, 100, almost 100% have some type of underlying condition that can be adversely affected by uh, COVID-19. And so uh, we built this dispensary out so that we would limit the period of time that people would spend indoors. We tried to uh, uh, create as many touchless surfaces as possible. Uh, we also kind of maintain our sanitation practices that we have at the other stores, but we incorporated sliding doors uh, into the uh, design so that people didn't have to touch uh, any items as they, as they came in and out. Uh, we also built it uh, built out a outdoor lanai where patients can wait outdoors instead of coming into an enclosed or indoor space. And we also have our new uh, pickup window, which is a small uh, clean room where uh, one patient can come in at, at a time and quickly pick up their medicine without even having to enter a dispensary or indoor space with uh, other people inside. So very 
clean, modern looking in here. Yeah, this is a, a, a slight departure from our first two dispensaries. The color scheme is, is similar to our other dispensaries, but uh, we went with a much uh, brighter and cleaner look than our previous dispensaries. Still not completely finished uh, decorating. We're gonna create a lot of warmness though when we're finished. So we, there's, some, there's some art that we're thinking of adding in and some fun elements. But so far it's been, uh, it's been a blast. Uh, the difference between Aloha Green and some of the other licenses is that we've really focused on concentrated products and manufactured cannabis products. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd say at Aloha Green, our sales are about 50-50 between flower and concentrates. And uh, we lead the market when it comes to producing those concentrates. And so if you look at our menu, we do carry uh, not only uh, multiple tiers of flour mm -hmm. that have various levels of THC as well as CBD. We also uh, produce the largest selection of cartridges and or uh, safe pulmonary administrative cartridges here in Hawaii. Uh, we have uh, ethanol based, we have solvent based, we have uh, CO2 based cartridges as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, we also carry hard concentrates, which is also the largest selection here on Oahu, including rosin, live resins, hash and chatter, and really all these different ways of producing the product. It just depends on the type of solvent, if any, that is utilized in the manufacturing. We've also pr started producing uh, a number of different lozenges. And then we have a bunch of other kind of tincture, topicals, and body oils that, that we produce for people that have topical ailments. Mm -hmm. We do have temperature checks now at all our locations for not only the patients, but our employees that are attending. And we have free masks or face shields that are available mm -hmm. for patients when they come in if they happen to forget their own. And all our uh, staff, of course, wear uh, protective gear or PPE that is uh, suitable for their for their role. So like any small business, the medical cannabis dispensaries really felt the shock of the economic impact of the pandemic. And you know, you folks were just a kind of a burgeoning industry. Can you talk about like the size of your business, you know, how that kind of affected some of your employees with the shutdown and everything? I think the local community has really uh, stepped up and shown that cannabis is a large uh, part of the Hawaiian economy and that it can continue to grow. Uh, we saw sales increase during the pandemic. There were, oh, periods, there were periods of panic buying uh, prior to uh, the essential business designation. There were periods uh, or there were days when products were almost sold out because there was hoarding that was occurring, similar to the toilet paper crisis oh. that we had and water and, and things like that where people are concerned that they're not able to purchase those items in, in the future. Uh, but once we were able to receive that essential business designation, we found that uh, patients uh, came to us about once a week, uh, once a week or every other week to uh, keep their supplies of cannabis you know, at a, at a suitable level. We're seeing decriminalization of cannabis, which I think is very, very important. If we have any hope of reaching uh, a point where Hawaii has adult use sales or recreational sales, then really we need to address the social injustice that uh, prosecution for cannabis has created within our community. And so mm -hmm. decrim is a very important part and next step, I think, that the, the, that the legislature needs to really look at. So, you know, we're watching the federal government closely, but is there any sense um, within the medical cannabis community just more nationally about what some of the prospects are on, on the national level? Yeah, we, we uh, very closely follow what's happening at the federal uh, level. And, you know, we were excited that uh, Biden-Harris administration uh, took over from the last administration. Um, Vice President Harris has very you know, liberal views, relatively speaking, uh, when it comes to cannabis, even though she was a prosecutor for much of her career time and uh, you know we don't disagree with President Biden's approach as well of having more evidence when it comes to uh, the legalization of cannabis uh, it does seem like that uh, the Attorney General that is uh, coming into power will allow the states to uh, further their state programs to the best of their abilities to see whether or not uh, this is the, the right path that the federal government should take and I do hope that banking uh, legislation which seems to be something that could happen in this uh, upcoming session or the next session uh, could occur, which would really open up the ability for businesses like ours to borrow money or to access to, you know, to even just access uh, banking services to pay our employees to uh, to be able to take out loans on, you know, uh, building out our business. Mm -hmm. So any last takeaways for our audience who is very interested um, about medical cannabis? Um, any, any last words or takeaways? Yeah, I think that uh, the program has been relatively quite successful when you compare it to other uh, nascent programs that started in other states. 
I think that it is coming to the point where the licensees are at a position where we do welcome more involvement within the industry. The only way for the industry to get to a place where a decrim can occur or adult use can occur is if more stakeholders become uh, vocal in how we build out these programs. And so I think I, I'm really excited for cannabis in Hawaii over the, for the next few years. And I think uh, there are going to be many changes that are going to occur. And I think it will be for the, for the best of the community and for, for all businesses. Thank you so much. And thank you for sharing this wonderful space with us. Thank you. Wow, what a modern, advanced establishment they have over there. It was so interesting to get a sense of what it's like on the dispensary ownership end. So on a similar note, my next guest is Bill Jarvis, a dispensary representative for Noah Botanicals, one of the three licensees on Oahu. He also serves as the new chair of the Hawaii Industry Cannabis Industry, High CIA. You can take it away, um, Bill. So great to have you. How are you Thank doing? Thank you. It's good to be here. You, you know this is a topic I love talking about, so I'm happy to be on. So in this industry that's highly competitive, has many barriers to entry, what are the biggest challenges facing the cannabis industry nationally? Uh, I, a couple of things, I think. Um, in terms of some of the trends, I mean, the, the big trend is really been a shift in public sentiment. Uh, when you think back a couple of years ago, maybe 40, 50 percent of the general population was in favor of federal legalization. Today, that number stands at about 67% of the U.S. population. And that's, you know, it's not a red state or blue state thing. 67% of the total population is in favor of federal regulation or legalization. And that number is higher for medical programs. And uh, I mean, just a, a, an incredible trend over the last few years. 16 states have now legalized, 32 have medical programs. And uh, New York just the other day legalized. And uh, uh, they've got a very interesting kind of social justice aspect to their program. 40% of the total taxes collected are going to be reinvested in uh, minority communities that have been disproportionately uh, targeted, if you will, on the, on the rather unsuccessful war on drugs. And so that'll be an interesting program to watch. But when it comes to, to challenges, um, you know, it's, it's, as Michelle mentioned, it's still a federally illegal business, and that creates a long list of challenges. And I could, I could be on for hours talking about some of the challenges, but uh, some of the biggies on a federal level are uh, lack of access to banking and just reaching profitability. Uh, mm -hmm. On the, the banking side of things, you know, we are substantially all cash businesses in this industry. It's very hard to establish banking relationships. And that's, that's unsafe for our communities. It's unsafe for our employees. It creates massive uh, administrative burdens. You think about the prospect of we're only 70 employees here at NOAA. When you pay every employee in cash every two weeks, it's a challenge. Um, wow. And then I talked about profitability a little bit. Um, you know, some of the players, major players in this industry who have the benefit of far more scale than we enjoy here in Hawaii are still not profitable. They've invested tens of millions, sometimes hundreds of millions of dollars in these businesses. And you know, it's a, it's a regulation heavy business and it's, uh, the, you know, taxation is, is pretty extreme in this industry. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but those are some of the, the, the real big challenges. Um, now, some of, the, some of the opportunities were that the industry has been growing at about a, a 20 plus percent clip for the last several years, and that's forecasted to continue. And so that does create some, some really great opportunities in terms of, of job creation, which frankly this country could use uh, a, a right fair now. amount of right now. It creates incremental tax revenue and it, and it provides a, a needed product and, and service in the community. So it's, a, it's an exciting industry to be in, and, and, uh, but it's, it's not without its challenges. So same question, but locally, what are the trends and challenges for the cannabis industry here in Hawaii? Yeah, um, it's, you know, it's, it's largely the same, but there are some uniquenesses for sure. Uh, you know, you've, you are no, no stranger to the legislative process. And, uh, you know, I, I think um, one of the trends that we're seeing that, that are really a good thing is over the course of the last several years, you know, as you start with legislation in the industry, 
you're painting with a pretty broad brush and you're trying to get most things right with the facts and the information you have, but you're not going to get it all right. It's impossible. And you, you need to start understanding the subtleties and the nuances. And, and you and others have always been good about listening and asking questions about, you know, what what's good about this business, what's hard about this business. And, and uh, you know, I think uh, we've made some good progress on the legislative front every single year and refined the, the rules and gotten a little better about it. And so that's made it good. Um, you also see more patients and doctors becoming educated mm -hmm. and doctors are including this as a more holistic part of, of uh, uh, a treatment plan. And I mean, just the other day, I went to, to uh, Blaisdell to get my COVID shot. And the, the woman who gave me the shot, she was a doctor over at Queens. When she found out that, that I was the CEO at NOAA, she, uh, she said, oh, we refer patients to you guys all the time. And so it's, it's neat to see. But, um, you know, the challenges are, are really, um, you know, they're, they're all the typical challenges of a startup. Capital intensive, very little inertia to get started. You've got to build all the infrastructure. You've got stores, grow facilities, all of that. You've got to weave it all together and make it work. Hire new staff. But... Um, you know, then you get to what are the challenges that are unique to medical cannabis. And from there, you think about no local banking options. We pay taxes in the 65 to 75% range because we can't deduct operating expenses like every other business in the country. Uh, and that's because of the federal illegality. We compete against the gray and black market. And these aren't small time operators. We support the personal right for, for someone to grow and for a small caregiver to grow. I've, I've always been a fan of that. Uh, but we're talking about product that is being offered in the market at large scale. It's unregulated. It's untested product. It hasn't been tested by a lab, and it's untaxed. And that puts licensees at a competitive disadvantage. But even more concerning to, to us as, as licensees is it puts potentially unsafe product out into the community. And, uh, and then I think finally, uh, just the fickle nature of the ag industry. Ag is hard. Uh, mm -hmm. You lose a crop and you're, you're going to be set back for months. And I, I have more respect for the for the farming community than ever before. So, wow, that's like a lot of challenges. But I, I sense um, a joy in your voice and an excitement about your work, Bill. So what makes you excited about the future of cannabis in Hawaii? It, you know, I, I've spent my entire life in in kind of underdog categories, emerging categories, rapidly changing industries. Uh, I, I love startups, and uh, you know it's it's been neat because it's a it's a a business that has been stigmatized. It's a product that's been stigmatized. There's all kinds of stereotypes about it, and it's neat to see the public embracing our industry and realizing we want to be good neighbors. We live in this community. It's 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 our home, and uh, so that excites me because people are realizing, hey, this cannabis business. You know, maybe maybe we shouldn't be quite as concerned about it as as uh, maybe we have in the past. Uh, I, I get excited about uh, things like House Bill 477, which is going to allow us, uh, if it passes, to have more locations. We've got so many communities that are underserved in Hawaii, and uh, that'll be, I think, a, a real good uh, way to, to give patients more access. We've got more products coming. Uh, edibles passed last year. That, that's real exciting. Uh, and so you'll see a whole suite of new products coming up. Uh, and then lastly, legalization. Um, you know, the, the industry is becoming more mainstream. And it's, I think it's really important to remember that the cannabis industry in Hawaii has been around for decades. And the debate as it comes to legalization isn't around whether or not cannabis will be a part of life here. It already is. And, and the decision that we're making is really about how do we make it safer for our community how do we make it safer for our customers? And how do we generate more tax revenue for the state at a time when it's definitely needed? I think that's the win for Hawaii. And uh, I'm, I'm real excited to, to engage in the debate. And, uh, but you know, overall, as you, as you mentioned, it's a challenging, interest, uh, challenging industry. It's one that I love and I'm, I'm wildly passionate about it. So, Bill, I want you to stay right there. We're going to bring in on our new guest, um, and there'll be three of us on here. But what I'd like, um, if, if Alelo can do this, is you mentioned House Bill 477 that's on the move. So what I'd like is if they can flash up that screen that shows the two bills that are moving, House Bill 477. And I really like that piece about opening up more uh, dispensary locations because you realize how uh, little access there is actually on the island of Oahu. 
Um, and then also Senate Bill 1139, which also provides more funding and, and um, positions for um, Michelle's office. And then it has a task force in there that will look at uh, a potential dual system program. So, you know, we're having the conversations about legalization, but we're taking it and we're doing it in a very deliberate way. Um, the status of all both of these bills is that they will be heard or are um, they're, they're waiting for their last committees to be heard in. And then, you know, we're, we're off to conference if they both make it through. Uh, I'd like to bring on now Nikos Leverance. And so Nikos and Bill, welcome. Nikos Hi. is the board president of Drug Policy Forum of, Ho of Hawaii, which is one of the partners in this um, arena of uh, medical cannabis for a long time. So I wanted to ask Nikos, uh, thank you for being here on the program. What does, um, can you tell us a little bit about Drug Policy Forum of Hawaii? Uh, thank you for the invitation, Representative Bellotti. Great to be here. Uh, drug Policy Forum is the, the state's oldest uh, nonprofit dedicated to drug policy reform. Uh, we were partially uh, an outgrowth of the work around establishing our state's very successful statewide syringe access program. Uh, we've had a publicly funded syringe exchange program here in Hawaii for 30 years, and it's been really successful in uh, keeping HIV rates low amongst injection drug users. So we believe that the, the current punitive approach to drug use uh, has to come to the an end, and we, we need to move toward a public health approach for drug use and other behavioral health problems. We, we were involved, very involved, in getting Hawaii's medical cannabis law passed in 2000, and we're also very involved in getting the medical cannabis dispensary law passed in 2015. Um, before, the Drug Policy Forum used to actually be a forum. We would partner with UH and uh, invite speakers from the continent and sometimes here uh, to present, uh, you know, topics on, drug, on drugs. Um, and we might be going back to that soon. But nowadays, we do public education through policy discussions and media outlets and uh, in forums like this. And we also uh, submit our, our opinions on bills before the legislature. So we support medical cannabis. We support adult use legalization of cannabis. Um, and we also support the decriminalization of personal drug possession and use, which is in alignment with the American Public Health Association and the Global Commission on Drug Policy and, and people who are aware that uh, you know, substance use disorder must be treated. And we don't think that you know, somebody has to be involved in the criminal legal system in order to access treatment. So wonderful organization. And I remember working with Drug Policy Forum on the medical um, dispensary laws. Personally, Nikos, how did you come to be involved in the cannabis um, in the issues? Uh, and how, how did you come to be involved in it when you returned to Hawaii? Well, you know, I've been interested in drug policy since we kind of knew each other back in high school. And I remember this this one graphic uh, that, that looked at the relative uh, uh, severity of, of various substances and cannabis, which is high on the list, you know, did not have the same, you know, negative impact that say alcohol and tobacco does. So that's that's always really resonated with me. And then I came across a great book by uh, an author named Peter McWilliams on uh, called Ain't Nobody's Business If You Do, The Absurdity of Conceptual Crimes in a Free Society. Then I went to law school and studied criminal law. And I saw how, you know, our drug laws and the enforcement of our drug laws, you know, played such a, a long and deep role in subjecting, you know, non-white communities to intergenerational cycles of incarceration, under education and economic instability. And, and actually worsen health outcomes too. So, you know, after law school, I, uh, you know, I, I worked around the legislative process for a little bit as a staffer, as a consultant, and it's also an advocate. So I worked for Drug Policy Alliance in California, and I, I worked on issues ranging from medical cannabis. California was the first state uh, that passed the medical cannabis uh, law through the ballot box in 1996, the Compassionate Use Act. I worked on syringe access, which is still regrettably a contentious issue there. Civil asset forfeiture reform, which you know the, your legislature legislature has been addressing, and hopefully we'll get something to the governor's desk this year. And also corrections reform and sentencing reform, and these are things that need addressing here as well. I also wrote a bill to ban random student drug testing in California public schools um, that passed by two thirds in both houses. 
with the opposition of the Office of National Drug Control Policy at the time. And uh, unfortunately, that was vetoed. But, you know, we have a climate there where that didn't happen. So I, I first came to these issues here in Hawaii. You know, I paid a little bit of attention with student drug testing. I was in a HPR debate, I believe, with uh, Peter Carlisle and Andy Pumatai. And uh, that, that was the very first radio interview I ever did. And I think this was in 2004. So when I came back to Hawaii to live, uh, I, I was invited to the Act 230 working group by Pam Lichty, uh, the pre president emerita and co-founder of Drug Policy Forum of Hawaii. And I've been involved in some capacity ever since. Well, we're lucky to have you here. So Nikos, you were listening to, I believe, what Michelle was saying about, you know, the, the program uh, at the Department of Health and what Bill was saying. And I kind of want us to have a little bit of a dialogue here. Yeah. Um, so the two questions I would kind of pose to both of you, first to you, Nikos, is what would you like to see happen uh, within the medical cannabis industry moving forward here? If we can get some feedback from Bill. And then also for, for both of you, what are some reasonable recommendations or steps both of you would suggest lawmakers take as the cannabis industry continues to grow here in Hawaii? So Nikos, you first. I think we heard some very good news from uh, Michelle, and uh, yeah, it's it's nice to have uh, an effective Department of Health, and uh, we we think that in terms of providing edible products to consumers, we you know many people, myself uh, included, when I was a medical cannabis patient back in California, edibles were my preferred delivery mechanism. So to the extent that you know, the, the rules can come out and give dispensaries guidance on that. That would be great. Um, I believe that we should look more into breaking vertical integration, even if just between uh, dispensaries, um, so that, you know, particular cultivars can be, you know, uh, can be transported between uh, dispensaries and, and maybe invite more businesses to engage in like delivery and some other supply services. And I, and I also think I would like to see dispensaries be more vocal with our congressional delegation about the need to pass the Safe Banking Act, which directly impacts their bottom line right now, as well as the MORE Act, which would remove cannabis from the Federal Controlled Substances Act. Bill, you want to respond to any of that? Because I think, you know, edibles, um, advocacy at the national level, all good things. A any thoughts, Bill? Yeah, I, I agree with a lot of the points that, that Nikos made. Um, I, I think uh, delivery, you know, you think of a, a lot of, uh, of patients just don't have the ability to even get into a dispensary. We don't, we're not like Starbucks. We're not on every corner. Uh, there's, there's only seven today on all of Oahu and, and uh, you know, s similar numbers, in fact, smaller numbers on a lot of the neighbor islands. Um, so, you know, delivery seems like a, a logical choice. It's also from a, from a cost perspective, you know, the cost of standing up one of these facilities can run five hundred thousand to a million dollars. Uh, contractors kind of know they've they've got you. Um, there's you know there's a lot of uh, security that you have to put in place, cameras, fencing, those sorts of things, uh, safes, all those kinds of things. It really drives up the cost. Um, delivery is a good option. It's a convenient option. I I tried it as just kind of a social experiment in Arizona a couple years ago. And I was literally sitting by the, the, the pool in a, in a condo that I'd rented for the week. And I was, I was just shocked. Uh, it, was, it was so convenient. I'd also say re reducing the friction in the process of getting a card. I can get prescribed opioids today. And all I do is run down to the neighborhood longs and I, I, I get the medicine. Uh, to even set foot in our store, you have to go see a doctor um, and uh, get essentially a prescription. It's a little different than that. But... Uh, that's the equivalent. Uh, you have to pay a couple hundred dollars. You have to pay a fee to the state. There's a lot of friction just to set foot in our store. Um, Nikos mentioned product options, and I, I agree. And and the final thing that I'd say uh, would really uh, help, and, and I understand this is a sensitive topic, and, and it's around advertising. It's very, very mm -hmm. hard to get an industry off the ground where you can't even tell your consumers about the product. Uh, it's, it's very, very challenging and, uh, um, you know, just, just uh, I think, an unnecessary barrier. So I'm going to give um, the last 30 seconds. I think those are great recommendations, Bill. Last 30 seconds. Nikos, what would you recommend to take as reasonable steps for lawmakers? I think reasonable, 
of decriminalization needs to be high. The threshold needs to be heightened by uh, to 30 grams per SB 758. We also need employment protections for medical cannabis patients, and and hopefully we'll we can get to that real soon. Thank you both. I think we could be on for another hour <laughs> and would have such a great discussion. I hope you folks will come back to talk stories sometime in the future. But thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Um, on that note, I want to take us to our final uh, community segment. And really, it actually kind of branches off some of the things that Nico's talked about, about how we um, are dealing with our most vulnerable communities. You know, this has been a hard week for us in the nation. It's been a hard week for us here in Hawaii as issues of race um, and hate have really risen to the forefront um, in our community conversations. I wanted to share with our viewers here that the House majority and Hawaii Democrats everywhere are committed to fighting against all forms of discrimination. At this time, our hearts especially go out to Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander communities who continue to suffer more and in greater percentages in the state. In this community segment coming up, we visited with Representative uh, Sunny Ganadin, and we visited with a community leader who I think you will find inspiring at Kuhio Park Terrace. Uh, Inocenta is a true community organizer, and her focus is on really empowering the students and children and keiki and teens who come through her doors at Kuhio Park Terrace. Please watch all the way through this video. Uh, there's lots of great resources, um, community resources there for Native Hawaiians, Pacific Islanders, and for people who want to help empower those communities. Um, I'm gonna sign off here, but please stay on and watch. Please stay safe, healthy, and informed. Wear your mask in public, and remember to follow good social distancing and hygiene guidelines. We'll see you on the next talk story, but please, please enjoy this community segment with me, Representative Ganadin, and with his community. Aloha. So I am here in beautiful District 30 with Representative Sunny Ganadin, and we'll be visiting with some of his residents. Representative Ganadin, tell me where, we're, where we are. Well, thank you so much for all joining us. We are here in the B building of Kuhio Park Terrace here in Lower Kalihi. Um, and we're joined by Inosanta Saunkiku. Um, she is the director of Pacific Voices. They are a program that is dedicated to youth and cultural empowerment um, here in the community. Can you tell us about the program here? Pacific Voices is actually uh, a program, like you said, part of the Coco Kelly Valley Clinic. And it, it started by the aunties in, in the community that you know, they were worried that a lot of their kids have grown up and are disconnected from our culture and tradition. We work with a lot of the uh, Micronesian kids, but we also open the space up to anybody. So it, it was uh, kind of interesting to have. We have a Chinese um, family that live right up off the place, and the, the daughter used to come down and just watch and then play with the kids too. So. We also have um, Samoan and Tongan kids that get, that live around the area that also came in. And it, it's really good to see them interact with each other and see the similarities that they all have. And the beauty of it is that when we share our traditional uh, stick dance that tells about our identities and who we are, even, th even those um, other Pacific Islander kids were like they pick up the movement and the, the things really fast. I love it when I when I ask them, are you warriors or chicken? They all scream, warriors, you know? <laughs> because it, you know, it's really, it really uplifts their spirit and it uplifts um, who they are and just knowing that there are these, there is these similarities that they have with one another. Well, first off, it's not easy being a kid and it's not easy being a kid in Kalihi, and oh, it's yeah. not easy being a kid in public housing. Mm -hmm. So um, you're doing such an amazing uh, job here of like making sure that kids' voices are being heard, that their culture is being honored, but why don't you just tell us about some of the things that they face every day? A lot of the kids are not given the opportunity to really shine and show who they really are. And so, you know, just being who they are like walking down the place because they're PI. Uh, kids, they're already, they're labeled as, you know, somebody who is troublemaker or what. 
literally we have kids from our program that was walking on, on the side of the sidewalk, stop. And then the police officer, you know, just stop him and tell him to get off the phone. But he's on the sidewalk. So he's, he had to come back and say, this is what happened to me. And it's like, we don't want that, our community to feel threatened or feel afraid of the people that are supposed to be protectors of our community. Coco Cali Valley Clinic has played a huge role in, in uh, collaborating with communities. So what happened was in the director of Coco Cali Valley actually reached out to the pastors in our community to find out how can we be more supportive to the things that you guys are going through. Now, I get the emotion because you don't usually get that, like, nobody really cares, but this director reached out to our community. So I bring the five pastors in front of him. They communicate with each other. And in fact, from that first meeting, it was like, um, they say, well, this is important. Um, a lot of the kids that uh, live here, they're, they're actually um, citizens because they're born here in the United States. Exactly. So, so, um, so, but they're not really treated like that sometimes mm -hmm. at school and then their parents are um, from Micronesia or some mm -hmm. other part of the Pacific. Yes. So, um, like, why do you put so much emphasis on them retaining their own culture and their own language? Well, I, I really believe that your identity is important for your own growth yourself. So if you don't know who you are and your history, where you came from, and what ancestry you belong to. Like when I first hear the story of my great, great, great grandfather play a huge part in bringing together the, uh, our people, that gives me pride to know that I'm part of that. So I want to give those to those children to, instead of focusing on all these negative things that they're experiencing here, they can connect to something that is beautiful and great that is of their own identity, yeah? And many of these kids, I always tell them, you are born into your position. You are not elected to your position. Therefore, your accountability is not just to uh, yourself, but to your whole line of lineage, your whole line of people. There is a reason why you're here. You need to find out that story. Many of them, they re relocate here because of health or because of education and because of um, job. So you need to know your story. How did you end up here? Because your story is important just like everyone else. And I think that it's it's, it grounds them and it makes them uh, be able to face anything that you know they, they have to face in the future if they know the, these important factors of their identities. So Rep. Gamigan, where are we? We are at St. Anthony's, the Catholic Church here in Lower Kalihi. It's off of Puuhale, so it's really right here in the heart of the first and second generation Filipino community um, here in the district. Um, it's my church, um, as somebody who grew up Catholic, um, yeah, it's a place that I, I try to come to um, um, often to, um, to honor um, the faith of my parents, yeah. So it feels like a real oasis here in urban Kalihi. There's this really nice, quiet space. So can you tell me about where we are in the church right now? Um, I guess we're off the side of the vestibule, so um, um, Filipino Catholics, they really honor the Virgin Mother, so she's right behind us over there. Um, and then there's some offerings as well as um, really a, a place to just kind of reflect. The Catholic community actually came together and now they um, say a prayer um, at the end of Mass, and it's a, and it's a prayer for the COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic. So, um, and it mentions St. Damien and St. Marianne Cope that they dedicated their lives to service of those who had an infectious disease. And um, and if you grew up Catholic, you know that a lot of it is based on ritual, of like um, saying the Lord's Prayer, getting communion, that kind of thing, um, and then showing up every Sunday. So reiterating that we should be conscious of um, keeping each other safe, of the pandemic as it happens, and, um, and how to react to that uh, has been 
really important way for people to uh, maintain their faith during the last year. Thank you. Thank you for sharing the space. I think it's really important because we all have uh, communities of faith in all of our districts. So this is, this is actually the first community of faith that we visited uh, as part of Talk Story. So thank you for sharing it with us.